Carolyn and I have had the privilege the last few days of having our little three-year-old grandson, Jebediah, with us. And the other night we were getting ready for bed and uh, had our Bible story and uh, uh, had our prayer. And uh, he always wants to sing some God songs. And so we sang a few God songs and we were talking about the love of God. And here's what a three-year-old said to me. Poppy, why does God love us so much? Now, how do you answer that? I said, well, you know, the Bible tells us that God is love. And I think that means he can't do anything else but love us. That's how God loves us so much. We're going to sing about his love this morning. Number 208, love divine, all love's excelling. I want you to sing it like you mean it, okay? Let's stand together. We're going to sing all four verses. Father, we, uh, we rejoice in having the opportunity and the privilege of being in your house today. It is so good to be here with my church family and uh, just to sense your presence this morning and to be able to sing praise to you is, is a tremendous blessing to my heart and I hope it's a blessing to all of those that are here today. It is a great privilege to be here, and we are blessed to have the strength and the health to be up and be going and to be here today. And I pray that we will not take this time for granted. I pray, Father, that we will listen attentively uh, to what you are saying through your word and then listen attentively uh, to your Holy Spirit as he speaks to our hearts today. 
Father, I believe that you will speak to us today. I believe that you have something to say to us today. And I pray that we will listen and we will not only hear, but we will receive and then we will obey what we hear. And uh, Lord, we, it, will, it will change our lives. And so, Father, I just want to thank you for my church family. I thank you for every member that's here, for many who aren't here today. And I pray and thank you for the visitors that we have this morning. Lord, it's so exciting to see new faces in our services any time that we see visitors here. And I pray that each one of them will feel welcome, feel loved. I pray that they will find a friendly church, a loving church. And Lord, more importantly, I pray that they will sense your presence here today. And you will just overwhelm us all with your sweet spirit. And Lord, let us know that we have truly worshiped you today. So Father, um, I commit myself in this service. I commit everyone here and everyone that will listen to the message that will be proclaimed today to you and ask you, Father, to do a tremendous work in us that you may work through us in a world that is lost and dying and is separated from you. And so, Father, bless this time, and we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, my dear church family, it is great to be back with you this morning. As most of you know, I was in revival last week and missed the last Sunday. Joe filled in and did a great job as usual, and I appreciate that very much. And I appreciate all of you being here. It's so good to be with you. It's so good to have visitors today. If you are visiting with us, we want to especially welcome you this morning. We would ask you to do us a favor and look in the back of the pew in front of you, and you should find a visitor's card. If you would please get pick one of those up, fill it out, and drop it in the offering plate where we can have a record of your visit, we would greatly appreciate that this morning. So I welcome you today, and I want each of you to welcome someone. So everybody welcome somebody, okay? God bless. Thank you so much. Would you be seated, please? I don't know if he's got this thing on or not. <laughs> Not afraid to 
bid this world goodbye Not afraid to close my eyes and die But for this courage I have prayed And in his arms I am not afraid When I cross that silent sea, those home lights beckon me. I feel no pain, and I'll fear no harm. Safe, secure in my Savior's arms. Not afraid to bid this world goodbye. Not afraid to close my eyes and die. For this courage I have prayed, and in His arms I am not afraid. Yes, in His arms, I am not afraid. Amen. Amen. There's a little Baptist coming along, you know, over there. Yes, sir. Like that. We're going to sing number 295, Near to the Heart of God. We'll do the first two verses, and then we'll go into a couple of choruses that might be a little bit new to you, but they all emphasize the presence of the Lord, and we want to be in His presence this morning as we continue in this service. Let's stand together and sing.
I'll sing that again, okay? Let's learn it a little bit this morning. That's all right, isn't it? There is a Savior. What joys express. His eyes are mercy. His word is rest. say amen. amen. Please stand as we pray. Let's all pray. In kind of gracious Heavenly Father, God, thank you, Lord, for this day you've given us, Lord, another opportunity, God, that we might be able to come out to your house, Lord, and God, worship you and praise your name, Lord. I thank you, God, for this privilege and honor that you've given us, Lord. I pray, God, you'd help us that we would never take it for granted, Lord, but we'd always cherish it, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd be this church. I pray, God, that you would help you, God, to grow, Lord for you and see lost souls saved. Pray God you be with our pastor and all the staff, Lord, on the church, Lord, you might bless them. I be with Brother Danny now as he begins to come up here soon, Lord, and bring the message, Lord. I pray God you would just touch him, Lord, and fill him with your spirit. I pray God you would help us, Lord, as we listen, Lord, that we would, uh, God, just take it in, soak it in, Lord. I pray God that you would help us, Lord, that we would apply it to our hearts and lives, Lord, we might be able to serve you better. God, I pray God you'd be with this, this offering that's about to be received. I pray God you would just Bless it for your honor and glory, Lord, that it would be used, Lord, for uh, the uplifting of you and your kingdom, Lord. I pray, God, that you'd help us, Lord, that we would give uh, as you'd have us to give, Lord. And I pray, God, that it would all be used, God, for your honor and glory. I pray, God, that you'd be with those that are sick, Lord, God, that couldn't come out today, Lord, that you just touch them, bless and encourage. I pray, God, you watch over us now as we uh, go out this afternoon, Lord, to, to serve you in the world, Lord, that we would serve you in the world, God, but not become the world, God, in the process. Pray, God, you wash over us now, forgiving my sins, in Jesus' name.
Thank you, Brother Gary and choir. Let's open our Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We will focus on one verse of Scripture this morning, and I trust that today's message will be a blessing to you. Philippians chapter 1. There is something special about assembling together to worship. I don't know about you, but I enjoy worshiping with my church family. There is what I call a spiritual dynamic that takes place um, in a service like this. You can't really describe it, but you know it's there. You know it's here. It's just a feeling. It's, a, it's an experience. It is a blessing uh, to be able to assemble together and worship together. And every time we come together, every time Christ followers come together, it is an opportunity for God to do something special in the lives of God's people. Now, God can do whatever he chooses to do, whenever he chooses to do it, in whom he chooses to do it, at any time he chooses to do it, but there is something special. There, again, I use the term a special spiritual dynamic that takes place when we assemble this way, and, uh, you know, we know that the Spirit of God lives in God's people, so that means that every time we come together, uh, as we are assembled together this morning, every one of us who possess the Spirit of God, we bring the Spirit with us. We know He's everywhere, but we have the presence of the Spirit in our hearts, and He comes to, to assemble with us and matter of fact, um, last night, I think Doug may have even mentioned it earlier today, you know, uh, where two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord says that he's in the midst. And so we're thankful for that opportunity and that privilege to have the Spirit of God, to have the Spirit of our Lord Jesus with us every time we assemble to worship as we um, prepare, we think about our upcoming revival and as we try to prepare you as the church for revival, Joe has done a good job on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night in doing that while I've been gone. But today, this message is in, in lieu of our, in, or in view of our revival and, uh, and I hope that it will be a blessing to you. And, and we're going to talk about how God works in us. Because every time, again, every time we assemble together, God wants to do something special in us. And I hope that you are in tune with the Lord. I hope that you have your spiritual antennas out, so to speak, and you are in tune with God and you are listening very carefully and, and have a very keen sense of his presence and you can hear his voice as he speaks to you so that whatever God says to you today and this next week and during the revival, that you and I and every one of us will be willing to be obedient to God. I believe that God wants to manifest himself to us every time we assemble together. And it's important that we listen attentively, that we listen prayerfully, that we listen carefully and we hear what God has to say to us. It's not just some man standing up here speaking a bunch of words into the air. If I am on target and I'm hearing God's voice prior to ever coming to this service and I believe that I have a message from the Lord, then certainly God is going to speak to those who come and listen to the Word of God. And you are here, and I hope and pray that's the reason, one of the reasons why you are here today is so that you will hear God speak to you. How often do we come to church and we really come desiring God to speak to us personally? Well, I hope that God will speak to all of us today. 
And so we're going to look at one little verse of scripture here in Philippians chapter 1. I want to begin reading in verse 1, but we're going to focus on verse 6. And uh, let's begin reading in verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want us to focus on verse 6 this morning, and I want to share a simple message with you entitled, God's Good Work in Man. God's Good Work in Man. Let's pray one more time. Father, Thank you for the reading of your word. I pray now that you will bless the proclamation of your word as I try to um, uh, share from this verse of Scripture uh, what I believe your spirit has allowed me to see. And I pray, Lord, that you will help each of us uh, hear with attentive ears and hearts and receive what we hear and apply what we hear. I pray this message will challenge each of us to look very carefully and prayerfully deep within our hearts to see where we are with you and to see if there is enough evidence in our lives that we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are at work in us. And so, Father, bless this message now to each of our hearts, and we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want us to look at this verse. Take your Bibles. I want you to look along with me as I point a few things out of this one little simple verse of Scripture. Paul is writing to a group of Christian people whom he considered to be very precious. They had helped him from the beginning of his ministry, and he loved this church very much. Matter of fact, I always say, or most of the time I say, this is Paul's love letter to the church at Philippi because he loved this church very much, and they had assisted him throughout his time in ministry. And so Paul begins here in verse 3, and he tells them that he is praying for them. Go back and let's read. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. In other words, every time I pray and every time I remember you and think about you, I'm praying for you. And I'm thanking God for you because you're precious to me. You have helped me. You've encouraged me. You've assisted me in years of ministry. And Paul was saying, I thank God for you. And then he says, always in every prayer of mine. Did you hear that? Always in every prayer of mine for you all making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And of course, that word fellowship comes from the Greek word koinonia, and it means communion and how they were assisting him and, and helping him in his ministry. And then he says, he says, I'm confident of this thing. I'm confident of this one thing. I am convinced. Listen to what he says now. He says, I am convinced of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. What is he talking about? He's talking about God's good work in men. In this text, he's talking about God's good work in them. And I want you to notice the word good here. That's the reason I included it in the title of this message because it is a good work. Anytime God works in someone, it is a good work because it is God's work and because God is good. Amen? And so uh, when we think about it being a good work, that word literally means that this work is a beneficial work. It is advantageous to the individual through whom or in whom God is working, it is also beneficial to God and to God's kingdom because God is constantly working with a purpose in mind to bring out the best in an individual so that he can use that individual to the utmost. And so um, it is a good work. Now, as we think about God's good work in men, which uh, is applicable to each and every one of us, and everyone in the world, because I believe that God works in everyone at least uh, at one time or the other to bring them to himself. 
so that those who are lost can be saved and those who are saved can go out and do what God has called and saved them to do. And so as we think about God's good work in men or in man, I want us to see four things from this little verse of Scripture. Number one, I want you to notice from the verse that God's good work in man is initiated by God. Look at what Paul says here in the verse. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he, and he refers to God, which hath begun a good work in you. And so Paul makes it very clear that God is the one that took the, the initiative to begin that good work in those people even prior to their salvation. Those in whom God is working today, he is working in them because he initiated the work. I want you to understand this and get it down. God always takes the initiative in, the, in working in the hearts and lives of men, and I'll tell you why. The reason is that man does not know God and does not seek God on his own. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, uh, in Romans chapter 3, listen to these verses, um, verses uh, 10 uh, and through 12, and then I'll skip on over and look at verse 18. In verses 10 through 12, Paul writes and he says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That means there's no righteous person in the world. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. You see that? There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Did you hear that? There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together to become unprofitable. And there is none that doeth good, no, not one. When Paul said there in verse 11 that there is none that seeketh after God, he is literally meaning there is none that searching out or seeking after, carefully and diligently seeking after God. And the Bible goes on and he says in verse 19 of that same chapter, for there is no fear of God before their eyes. They could care less. I want to tell you before I was saved, I could care less about God. I believed there was a God. I believed there was a Jesus before I was ever saved. I, was, I grew up in the church as a boy until I was about 12 years of age and made a profession of faith. And so I could tell you, if you ask me if I believed in God, I'd tell you, well, certainly I believe in God and I believe in Jesus. But I want to tell you, that doesn't save anyone. I was still just as lost as I'd always been and, and continued in that condition until I was approximately 25 years of age when I, when I genuinely got saved. And so I want you to understand the Bible tells us that God, he has to take the initiative in the heart of any person to bring a person to himself because we're all sinners. We've gone out of the way and there is no one, absolutely no one that will seek God on his own. No one. And so God always takes the initiative. And I want you to see something else here. The motivation behind that initiative is love. Brother Gary was talking about the love of God a few minutes ago. The, the motivation behind God's initiative in seeking out men and doing a work in them is love. The Bible says in the book of 1 John that God is love. It's not that love is God, but God is love. That is his very nature. And therefore, if he is love, the only way he knows how to respond is out of love. Even in his justice, even in his justice, God, I believe, responds out of love. And so we find that God is love. God, the Bible says in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then over in the book of 1 John, listen to this. First John and John uh, in First John, John wrote verse seven of chapter four. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God. Are you listening? Not that we loved God first, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And then over in verse 19 of that same chapter, listen to what John says. He says, we love him because he first loved us. 
Listen, God always takes the initiative. And the motivation behind that initiative to bring us to himself is love. Now, so we see, first of all, that God's good work in man is initiated by God. The second thing I want you to see from the verse is this, that God's good work in man is an internal work. It is an internal work. You say, why do you say this? Well, look at the verse. He says, being confident of this very thing, that he, God, which hath begun and initiated that good work in you, watch this, is in you. He says, he began that good work in you. That means that the work that God does on us is a work that is done in us. When God is working on your life and he's working on my life, guess what? He's working in us. And you say, well, why is that? And, and, and how does God work in us? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you, okay? First of all, God's internal work. Now, listen to this. When God begins a work in someone, guess what he targets? He targets the heart. When God began a good work in me, he targeted my heart. When God began a good work in you, if you're here saved today, he targeted your heart. He targets not only the human heart, but he targets the human spirit. And so God's internal work targets man's heart and spirit. You say, well, why is that? It is because man's heart, the condition of man's heart. The Bible says in Ephesians 4 and 10 that the heart is blind. I want to read these verses in Ephesians 4 and um, listen to this. Ephesians chapter 4 and, uh, excuse me, uh, verse 18. It says, having, uh, verse 17, read verse 17 with me. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened. Now remember, Paul said in Romans chapter 3 that no one is good, no, not one, and no one has understanding. No one can understand, and no one seeks God on their own. So therefore, if a person is going to want God in their life, then God must first want them, go to them, take the initiative, and do a work in their heart. And so he says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Why? Because of the blindness of their heart. The Bible says that man's heart, the natural man, the unsaved man, his heart is blind. That means it cannot see spiritual things. And, and secondly, the heart is full of evil. Listen at these verses. Genesis 6 and 5 says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And do you know that stands true today? That stands true today for every single person. Our thoughts and our, the intents of our heart, they're evil. It's evil continually. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, that out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. That's the natural man. And so out of man's heart, listen, it is full of evil and it is blind. Not only that, but the Bible says the heart of man is rebellious toward God in Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 23. And then I want to read you this in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, listen to this, the heart is deceitful above all things. And desperately wicked, who can know it? Let me repeat that verse. The heart, that is the human heart, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, who can know it? And then he goes on to the next verse and says, I, the Lord, search the heart and I try the reins. And so God knows our hearts. But when God begins this internal work, he focuses on, he targets, if you please, the human heart and the human spirit. And secondly, God's internal work is in the human heart is performed through various means. And let me give you four or five of those means. First of all, uh, through his Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus said in John 16 that when the Spirit of God was to come and he came in Acts chapter 2, 
on the day of Pentecost. He said, when the Holy Spirit comes, the great comforter, he is going to, he's going to reveal Jesus. And he's going to reveal truth. He will lead you into all the truth. He says he's going to convict or reprove, the King James Version uses in, in there in John 16. He will reprove the world, the whole world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And so the Holy Spirit of God is used to do an internal work in man so that he will illumine that mind that is darkened. He will open a heart that is closed and he will help humanity see him and understand him, give man, uh, uh, unredeemed man, an opportunity to know and to understand enough that he or she can be saved and be born again and be brought into a relationship with God. But then he not only works through the Holy Spirit, he also works through adversity. God works in the lives of his children through adversity. I want you to read uh, along with me or listen, if you would please, uh, these verses uh, in the book of James chapter 1. And James wrote and he said, My brethren, and he's speaking to Christian people. He uses that term, brethren. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or various temptations. And that word could be um, translated trials or testings. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall or you experience various trials, adversity, temptation. Why? Knowing this, that the trying or testing of your faith worketh patience. And that word patience is endurance and uh, uh, confidence. And, and, and so God, through adversity, God works something good on the inside of us. He does an internal work in us through adversity to bring us to the place that he wants us to be. And then uh, along with adversity comes suffering. Suffering could be considered a form of adversity. But suffering is something else that God uses to bring his children uh, uh, to where he wants them to be. Now, why is he doing that? Because the Bible says in the book of Romans that God has, listen to this, some believe in predestination. I believe in predestination too. I believe that the Bible says that God has predestined every single follower of Jesus Christ to be conformed to the very image of Jesus, his son. And so God is predestined that every single one of us be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And so what does God do? God has to get our attention by taking the initiative, coming to an old sinful heart and life, a mind that is darkened, a heart that is evil, and through the power of his spirit and, the power, and through adversity and through suffering and through uh, dis discipline, by the way, in Hebrews chapter 12, for those who are his and through the mighty, powerful word of God that is sharper than a two-edged sword, that pierces to the deepest recesses of a person's being. God uses those means to reach the heart and the lives of those who are his and those he wants to become his to bring them to himself and bring them to a place that they will be more like his son, Jesus Christ. If you are in adversity right now, if you are suffering right now, I want you to know if you will allow God to use that suffering and that adversity in your life, he will use it for your good and his glory it, it, it will be a good work that he is working in you and he will bring something good out of that if you will let him. So it is an internal work. So number one, God's good work in man is initiated by God. Number two, it is an internal work. And number three, notice the text, it is an intentional work. It is an intentional work. He says, being come of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. It is very intentional for the reason, some of the, one of the reasons I just mentioned a moment ago, to conform us to the very image of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to listen to this. When I say that this work is intentional, I mean it is very deliberate, it is planned, and it is purposeful. It is a very deliberate, planned, and purposeful work that God does in every single one of his children. And what does he do it for? Again, he targets man's heart, and he does so to give man a new heart and spirit. Now listen to this passage. 
Ezekiel 36, and I know this, these verses um, were written for the nation of Israel. And for many Jewish people, this verse is still future. The, the fulfillment of this verse is still future. But I want you to note that when God, when Jesus Christ came, he said this. Now listen carefully. When Jesus came, he said that there was a fold. As he was talking about him being the shepherd and the sheep and, so, and, and uh, his children being the sheep, he says there is a fold that will come in that, that knows not yet. And he was talking about the Gentiles. That, that the Gentiles would be included in his fold of, of children. And so um, I want you to know that this promise that God gave the nation of Israel in Ezekiel 36 has come to pass in, in, in Gentiles. And, and we see that not only through indisputable proof from the Word of God, but we see that in the, in the proof that comes through the lives of those who are radically changed when they come to know Christ. But God told the nation of Israel, listen to this in Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, as he's speaking to them, and listen, if you go back and read that text, you'll discover that, you know, God had chosen the nation of Israel. They were his chosen people. And uh, he had been leading them and guiding them and helping them along. And they just kept rebelling, kept rebelling, kept rebelling. And the heathen nations around the nation of Israel were looking at the nation of Israel and saying to them, "You," in so many words, and I'm paraphrasing, but you mean to tell me that you are the people of God? Because they expected God's people to be different. But God's people weren't any different. They were rebelling against God. And so God gave them this word and he said, I'm going to bring you back to a land. I'm going to bring you back to the land of promise and this is what I'm going to do. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall seek my judgments and do them. And so God promised the nation of Israel, there's coming a day when I'm going to put a new heart in you. I'm going to take that old cold, hard, stony heart out of you and put a heart of flesh in you. Why? So that you will, will keep walk in my statutes and you shall seek my judgments and do them. And so what did God do? On the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God came, and this is why Paul wrote what he did in 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, 17 when he said, Therefore, if any man, any person be in Christ and Christ be in him, he or she is a new creature. All things pass away and behold, all things become new. You see, that's the radical change that takes place in the heart and the life of a person in whom God is working. And so that is God's plan. That's how he does it. So God's work is an intentional work to bring about a change in a person's heart and spirit, to give a lost person a new heart and a new spirit, which will in turn cause one to consistently walk with God and obey God's word. And thirdly, the person, listen, the person will not only obey God's word, but in doing so, he will carry out the work of God. The person will bear fruit according to John 15 and what Jesus said there, if we're his children and he is in us and we are in him and we are attached to the vine who is Jesus, then we will bear fruit. We will bear much fruit. And then the person will mature in the faith. Uh, it will be a blessing to others and that person's life will bring glory and honor to God. Bring honor and glory to God because we'll become more like Jesus. In 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, listen to what Paul said. He said, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now let me read you a paraphrase of this verse. Listen carefully. To to paraphrase this, but we Christians have no veil over our faces. We can be mirrors that brightly reflect the glory of the Lord. As the Spirit of the Lord works within us, we become more and more like Him. 
we become more and more like him. That is his ultimate goal. That is his ultimate purpose in your life and in mine is to conform us in the very image of his son Jesus so that a lost and a dying world can see Christ in this world of darkness. And so um, it is an intentional work. Finally, I want you to see a fourth thing from this verse, this one little verse. And that is that God's good work in man is an incessant work. An incessant work. That literally means that it is a continual work. You say, why do you say that? Because the verse says, God said that he will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. That word perform means to fulfill. It means to fulfill and uh, uh, further than what it is. It means to accomplish. It means to complete the work that he began. And you know what? For some of us, God began a long time ago. There's some of you sitting here this morning that, you know, some of you are in your 70s and 80s. Uh, God came to you. He took the initiative to come to you, and he, he birthed you into his family through the new birth experience. He gave you uh, his spirit to live in you, and he's been working in you for many, many years. Some of us who are here this morning, you may be a new Christian, and God hasn't been working in you and on you very long. But you know what? According to the Bible, he's going to continue that work in you. And, and for those of us who, who, who God has saved and, you know, he's been working on all of us for quite a while. But I want you to understand that Paul was convinced. He said, I am convinced, I'm con I confirm this, that the work of grace that God began in those Philippian Christians at conversion would be continued until the day of Jesus Christ. When is the day of Jesus Christ? It's when Jesus comes. So that tells me, that no matter how long a person has been saved, God is continually working in their life. And he will work in their life from the moment they're saved until the time they die and go up to eternity to be with God or until Jesus Christ comes, whichever comes first. Because this is an incessant work. It is a continual work. He says, I will perform it on the day of Jesus Christ. Christ. And you know what this tells me? Now, I want you to listen to me because some of you may be here this morning or they may, there may be someone who will listen to this message who says, well, I just don't believe in the eternal security of the believer. Well, I want to remind you, my dear brethren, that Jesus said in John chapter 10 that he gives all of his sheep eternal life. That word means eternal. It means perpetual. It means never-ending life. Now, if he gives them eternal life, that means they're going to have eternal life from now on. But I want to just say to you this morning that I believe this is another indisputable proof that God gives his children, those who are genuinely saved, eternal life, and they will never perish because God says in his word, from the moment he begins the work in them, he will perform that work in them until they die or Jesus comes again. So I'm telling you, it confirms eternal security. God has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Hebrews 13, 4 and 5 says, Let your conversation, your lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, God has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. That is a promise of God. God has promised that once he begins this good work in someone, he will complete this good work in them. So in conclusion, let me ask you a few questions. Number one, is God working in you? Number two, what indisputable proof or evidence do you have that you can put your finger on this morning that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt God is working in you. Now, now, now let's get real serious, okay? I know, I know I, you know I'm winding down and some of you are getting your Bibles together and getting ready to go, but now this is a very important time of the service and I'm not trying to be critical here or rude in any way. I'm just saying this is very, very important. I didn't say all that I've said and God did not give me all that I've said to say unto you for you to miss what I'm about to say and what God maybe want to, what he wants to do in your heart. 
So number one is God working in you. And number two, what evidence do you have that he's working in you? Number three, are you submitting to that work? Or are you rebelling against that work? Are you willing to listen to God? Are you wanting him to work in your life? Do you want him to change your heart, give you a new spirit? Now, let's face the facts. Let's get down to where the rubber meets the road. Let's get down to the nitty-gritty. We don't like to think about this, nor do we like to talk about this. But every single one of us here, including the man that's speaking to you right now, we're all sinners. And we've all got problems. We've all, we all have sin in our life from time to time. That doesn't mean we habitually practice sin, but it means that we disobey God from time to time. And oftentimes, because of our old human nature that's still on the inside of us, guess what? We don't confess that sin. And we walk around like David did after he committed adultery with Bathsheba for a year before God sent Nathan the prophet to him and confronted him about his sin and David was broken before a holy God. And he says, oh Lord, I've sinned against you. In Psalm 51, he cried out to God and he said, God, I've sinned against you and you alone have I sinned against. My dear brethren, listen, I want you to know we're all sinners and we all have problems and we all have sin. I want to ask you, where is your sin today? I know where mine is. Where is your sin? And is your sin confessed? Do you know right now that there's absolutely nothing standing between you and your heart and God? Do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that, that you can leave here today out of the doors of this church after heard the, having heard this message and God speaking to your heart through this holy word this morning and know that you can leave here with a good conscience? Are you going to be too ashamed this morning to, to stand up in just a moment during this invitation time and maybe wake, make your way down to these pews or down to this altar and, and do business with God? You see, we're living in a generation of people that are ashamed I want to remind you that Jesus said when we're ashamed of him before men, we'll be ashamed. he'll be ashamed of us before the Father which is in heaven. I want to tell you, the church is no place to be ashamed. Matter of fact, the Bible says we're to confess our faults one to another. Now, you don't have to come down here and spill your guts before the whole congregation, but I can tell you one thing we all need to do. We all need to find ourselves on our faces and on our knees before holy God praying and asking God to do a tremendous work in our hearts because we all need it. Last night, we had a church-wide call prayer meeting. Guess how many showed up? Sixteen. Sixteen people showed up to pray. Now, I'm not coming down on you this morning. I'm just stating a fact. Sixteen people thought it necessary enough and important enough to come down here and pray for revival. That's why we never have revival. It's because people are unconcerned. And the truth is, there's some of you sitting here right here, and I'm just speaking truth in love, but the truth is there's some of you sitting right here this morning, you've already planned not to come to the services during the revival because you've got other things going on. You've got ball games, you've got golf tournaments, you've got all fishing trips, you've got all kind of things planned that you're not going to come to the revival. How do you expect God to speak to you unless you're in a service in that spiritual dynamic that I was talking about so that God can do a work in your heart through the preached word of God? I want to tell you, you won't get it out on the golf course. You won't get it out on the bass boat. You won't get it out on the ball field. You won't get it there because your mind and heart's going to be focused on someone and something else. You need to be in church. You need to be in the house of God hearing the word of God. The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, I know some of you are thinking, oh, preacher, you, you're getting riled up this morning. Well, listen, I want to remind you, Paul, the word of God tells me, as Paul told Timothy, that I am to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering because there's going to come a day when people will not endure sound doctrine and will not endure the truth. And we're living in those days right now. We don't like the truth, but listen, as long as I, God gives me breath and he allows me to be your pastor, I can promise you one thing. I'm going to do my best to speak to you truth in love. You know that I love you, every single one of you. I love you, everyone. I may not know you, but I love you in the Lord. And I'm here to help you, to encourage you, to confront you if necessary, 
just like God confronts me. I get this a lot more than you do. I get it when I'm preparing it. I get it again when I'm preaching it. I get it twice to your one time. And I try to really listen to what God is saying through these messages. I don't just preach these messages to you. These messages are for me as well. So I encourage you today. Do something about God's work in you. If God's working in you, don't be ashamed to show it. If you need to come this morning and do business with God, do it. If you're in the revival, you're attending the revival and God speaks to you, do whatever he says do. You'll never regret it. Matter of fact, you'll be blessed by it. And others will be blessed by it. The Bible says that when believers are confronted with the word of God and God moves on their hearts and they do not obey him, then they quench the spirit of God. Is that what we want to do? Do we want to quench the Spirit of God? You know what that means? That means that we pour a fire and we pour water on the Spirit of God and say, Oh, Spirit, I just don't want this right now. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. Or I'm ashamed or I'm embarrassed. Not now, Lord. I've got too many things going on in my life. We're too involved in this and we're too involved in that and I can't come to this meeting and I can't come to this service and I can't do this and I, I've got to go, 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 go. Well, I'm going to tell you something. Now, you better listen to me. God gives every one of us a free will to do what we choose to do, and he will allow us to do that. But if we do it long enough, and we are a child of God, there will be discipline. And that discipline can be very grievous. Not only that, but we will stand before Jesus Christ and give an account. Every time that we should have been in the house of God that we weren't, unless there was some real good excuse that God would receive, and I don't know of very many, unless you're really sick and you can't come or you've had a death or you're dying, is about it. We put so many things before God and before church. And out of, out of my love for every one of you, I know there's some of you sitting here this morning that at one time you were so active in this fellowship, you were here every time the doors were opened, you in, involved yourself in everything that was going on, but for whatever reasons you've pulled back and you've pulled away and, and, and you have now become, some have become Sunday morning goers only. I just want to help you. I want you to be confronted with the truth. The truth hurts sometimes. But the truth is, the truth will always set us free. There may be some of you here this morning, God's working in you right now. He's been working in you and on you for a while about salvation. He's been calling you to be saved. And if he's speaking to you and calling you and working in you this morning, working in your heart, oh, please don't put him off. You don't know how often, how many times, or how long God will continue to draw you and deal in your heart. Don't put that off. Come and give your heart and life to Jesus. There may be some of you who are here that are saved. You know that you're saved. You have no doubt about your salvation. But you know that you're not where you need to be. You're, you know this morning you are not where you once were back last year or a few years ago. You need to make some adjustments. And the only way you can do that is to do that in your heart to God and repent of whatever it is and get that thing right with Him. There could be numerous decisions that we could make this morning, and I just pray that we'll all be obedient and just obey the Lord let's pray my father I I presented this message with as much enthusiasm with as much sincerity and love that I have in my heart 
And I can honestly say as I stand before you this morning, I love these people. And I would do nothing. I would never intentionally do anything to hurt anyone. And my speaking truth in love is not designed to hurt them. It's designed to help them. And Lord, I have to speak the truth. You speak the truth in love to me. Oftentimes my wife speaks the truth in love to me. Sometimes brothers in the Lord speak the truth in love to me because they love me and they're concerned about me. I pray that we'll all come to that place that we can accept and receive truth in love. And I pray, Lord, that it will do the work that needs to be done in us, that we will make whatever adjustments we need to make to align ourselves with your word and your will. Father, in the end, when we take our last breath, the only thing that will really matter is whether or not we know you and how we have lived our lives because we will stand accountable for everything we've said and done and haven't done in these bodies of flesh, whether it be good or bad. Some people will receive great rewards in heaven. Some people will get in by the skin of their teeth, so to speak, and not have anything to show for their Christian life. And some people won't get in at all because they never trusted Jesus as Savior and Lord. Oh, my Father, I pray as we open this invitation, I pray that people will not be ashamed but will come not for my benefit but for your honor and glory and the good of our church and for their good. So bless this time, I pray. And I praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.